Just after midnight on the 27th of October 1962, a top-secret U-2 spy plane took off from an airbase outside Fairbanks, Alaska. It was the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis. The United States had discovered that the Soviet Union, in connivance with Cuba's communist dictator Fidel Castro, had secretly installed nuclear missiles just 90 miles off the coast of Florida. The USSR could destroy the entire eastern seaboard in just a few minutes. President John F. Kennedy and his administration was desperately searching for a peaceful resolution to the tense standoff with the Soviets, demanding that Premier Khrushchev remove the missiles from Cuba. One error by either side could trigger World War III. Captain Charles Maltzby's U-2 flight out of Fairbanks was routine, involving the aircraft overflying the frozen Novaya Zemlya, a Siberian island a thousand miles south of the North Pole, collecting air samples to test the Soviet nuclear weapons tests. The United States had already flown 42 U-2 missions in October 1962, searching for evidence. Maltzby was a highly experienced fighter pilot who had been shot down during the Korean War, surviving 600 days as a prisoner. The 27th of October mission duration was supposed to be 8 hours, flying up to 70,000 feet, or 14 miles above the ground where the curvature of the Earth and the blackness of space was visible. The U-2 was the highest flying aircraft in the world. The U-2 flew as part of a CIA operation to overfly the USSR, gathering photographic intelligence. The aircraft's great altitude was supposed to protect it from interception. But on the 1st of May 1960, Soviet missile defences had shot down a U-2 piloted by Gary Powers over Ekaterinburg, Powers being captured and held until February 1962. A danger of flying near the North Pole was loss of compass because of the Earth's magnetic field, and Maltzby would navigate using the stars. As the mission progressed, the shining aurora made it difficult to differentiate stars. He collected his samples when he thought he was close to the North Pole, turned port 90 degrees, then reversed the turn for 270 degrees, heading home. But Maltzby was soon lost. Usual practice was for returning U-2 pilots to rendezvous with the U.S. Air Force rescue aircraft off Barter Island on Alaska's north coast. Maltzby radioed the rescue plane, whose pilot said he would fire flares every five minutes to bring the U-2 home. Maltzby saw nothing, and ominously the rescue pilot's voice grew fainter until he started picking up instead a stronger signal, Russian voices and music. A top-secret U-2 was now lost over Soviet airspace and running out of fuel. The Soviets could see the U-2 on radar and began scrambling MiG-19s to try and intercept Maltzby's aircraft and shoot it down. A thousand miles away at Galena Air Station near Fairbanks, interceptor aircraft were scrambled to try and find and escort Maltzby's aircraft to safety. F-102 Delta daggers roared off, two armed with nuclear-tipped Falcon air-to-air missiles. The pilots' orders were unequivocal, destroy the MiGs and escort the U-2 home. Shooting down the MiGs, particularly using small nuclear missiles, would cause the Soviets to retaliate elsewhere. Defense Secretary Robert McNamara was informed 90 minutes after the U-2 had gone missing. McNamara was furious and immediately informed President Kennedy. The President ordered all air sampling missions worldwide cancelled immediately to prevent any repetition of what was happening over Siberia. Meanwhile, Captain Maltzby held his U-2 at 70,000 feet. He saw the MiGs rising up to try and shoot him down, but they could only manage 60,000 feet. But it was his fuel situation that was most worrisome. He had been aloft for nine hours. He needed to keep at least 12 minutes of fuel for emergencies and knew the U-2 could glide for over 200 miles without power. With the MiGs shadowing him from below, Maltzby switched off his engine and battery power, losing all radio connection with U.S. forces. 
After a while, the MiGs peeled off to refuel, but fresh aircraft replaced them almost immediately. Maltzby knew what was at stake. The U-2 could not fall into Soviet hands, and he didn't relish torture and imprisonment at the hands of the Soviets either, as his colleague Gary Powers had suffered less than two years earlier. Maltzby was determined to stay aloft and find Alaska and home. The arrival of dawn showed Maltzby the way. He was actually heading the right direction towards Alaska. He soon left Soviet airspace and decreased his altitude to 25,000 feet once he was absolutely sure he was over friendly territory. Within minutes, two F-102s took position off his wingtips. Almost out of fuel, Maltzby had to put the aircraft down on a small airstrip on Alaska's northwest coast. It wasn't easy. The U-2 landed much too fast and skidded along the icy runway, burrowing deep into the snow. Maltzby survived. He had been airborne for an incredible 10 hours and 25 minutes, which remains a record U-2 flight. 13 days later, the tension between East and West ceased when Khrushchev agreed to remove the missiles from Cuba. But the Soviet leader noted that Maltzby's wandering U-2 could have easily been mistaken for an American nuclear bomber on its way to a sensitive target in the Soviet Union and triggered the response that everyone feared so greatly. Once again, nuclear Armageddon had been narrowly avoided during the dark days of the Cold War. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share and also help support my channel at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box. Thank you.